preparing. Got it. All right. Welcome, everyone. We are delighted to have you join us for this week's session of Let's Talk North Carolina Genealogy. We are fortunate to have with us today Shelton Tucker as our speaker, who is going to share with us a case study, more or less, of his own family research. And we want to give you a nice introduction for Shelton and his background and his experience. So I do have some information that we want to share for Shelton. So Shelton is a retired finance professional, and he's held executive positions with banking, consumer foods, and consumer electronics. Through his experience of an, as an expat living and working in Europe and Africa, he has spent time exploring the genealogy of his family through primary research. As a professional financial executive for First Chicago, London, Coca-Cola, Africa, he's honed his investigative and analytical skills to uncover a family history that rivals Alex Haley's roots. We're very much looking forward to hearing this. <laughs> he's presented some of his findings at various conferences and events focusing on history and genealogy. He's a graduate of Tennessee State University and Meharry Medical School with a BS degree in healthcare administration and planning and he earned his MBA from Clark Atlanta University. Shelton is currently working on a book about his family's history. So hopefully we can hear more about that today and hold you accountable for getting it done, right? So we can buy it and read it. So Shelton, we're very appreciative to have you join us. Welcome. Um, and, you know, actually, Renata, do you want to make a comment? I'm going to keep just your voice. A, just a little one, Shelton, go ahead and please start sharing your screen. Uh, I okay. just wanted everyone to know that I probably would have introduced Shelton because we grew up in the same uh, historic black neighborhood in Hampton, Virginia. And although he's an old man because he's <laughs> a couple of years ahead of me, so we didn't run with the same people, but um, my mother taught him and uh, he's we've known each other forever. And I'm very proud to be uh, hosting him here on our platform today. So Shelton, welcome and the time is all Thank here. you. Can you all hear me? We can perfectly. Great, thank you. And hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Renata and I go way back. I remember her in, in uh, what do you call them? Uh, those pigtails? <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. Way back. Uh, and, and her mother is one of the most admired and esteemed uh, teachers at our uh, Aberdeen Elementary School. And I wanted to at least acknowledge that she was a major influence in, in my life. And uh, I'm so proud to know that Renata has carried on with the legacy of being an educator. But with that said, uh, I want to also welcome all of you. Some of you are from uh, my home ch chapter of Augs uh, by the Sea, uh, Hampton Roads. And uh, I know that uh, some of you may be from, uh, m some of my relatives were invited. Um, my uh, family comes from the Pitt County area, and that's what we are gonna be concentrating on today with this family research that I've done. And I'm very excited to, to tell this story because I didn't hear of it growing up from any of my relatives. And uh, we'll discuss that in a few minutes. But the title of my presentation is My Family's Exodus Story uh, of Thomas Bell, Henrietta Bell, a military couple. And the reason I mentioned military couple is because, believe it or not, that thing actually uh, continued throughout my family's history. Uh, and we have documentation that supports that. Um, but first, I want to tell you about what, what we want to discuss today. I don't know whether many of you from the area uh, knew that there was an important historic uh, event that happened back in 1863 that made the New York Times, uh, and that's national news. And it was an event uh, called Potter's Raid. And when I saw that report, uh, I was very interested because it was involving the mass exodus of African-Americans who had recently been emancipated 
uh, in January of that year, but yet had not been released from physical slavery. Uh, and uh, this was a story that I had to look into because when I looked into it, it, it seems that it would involve a number of my people. I did have some information before I found out about this story that I did have uh, relatives that were involved with the Civil War. Uh, but this New York article, New York Times article, the raid in North Carolina official report for uh, General Foster uh, about how the rebels immense destruction of public property and ironclad and two steamboats destroyed at Tarboro. And this article was written in July of 20, uh, July 27, 1863. Okay. Now, as part of the research, uh, in doing the research, I've uh, this is a very, if you're interested in looking at the raid uh, in detail, I would highly recommend this book uh, written by David A. Norris. He did a very good job in sourcing a lot of data related to this raid uh, and expedition in 1863. So if you get an opportunity to uh, uh, get at this book, I, I would definitely say it's a very, it's an excellent starting point because it, it provides a number of references and footnotes. W one of the key thing about uh, what I want to do here today is show you a couple of things. I, I, I won't talk too much about the history of Potter's Raid. I would encourage you if you want to know more detail about that to uh, get the book. However, uh, I did some research on my own. And one of the more important things to do is I read a lot of newspaper articles from, an, and let me tell you, when you read uh, newspapers that were coming from, of course, the Northern papers versus the Southern papers, uh, you're gonna get different viewpoints. And however, some you could glean some good information from there. And that's exactly what I did. One of the things that I gleaned from this particular article that came out of Kinston was that, oh, hold on, let me go back. I think I moved forward. How did, I got a new uh, computer and I don't, uh, let me backspace real quick. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to go backwards on this one. Uh, well, anyway, I, 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 for sake of time, I won't go backwards. What that article pointed out is that they sent out about, um, this was an expedition that the union was doing to destroy an ironclad in Tarboro. Uh, and they also destroyed a railroad bridge and they destroyed a uh, cotton factory. But they also, uh, when they reached Greenville, they also released 25 Negroes from jail, uh, who had been imprisoned for attempting to get inside our lines in order to join the colored regiment at Newburgh. They had been condemned to be shot, but the sentence will not be carried out, at least for the present, it will not be, as they will soon be clad in the military blue of our army. And this was an article that was written. The, the article before mentioned that the Union troops now, remember, this was before they formed the United, uh, the uh, USCT, uh, the colored troops or regiment. Uh, they, they had 50 mounted Negroes, uh, in other words, 50 Negroes riding horses. And it's important to know that because it's very often, it's, uh, it's not very often you see, uh, you know, when I was doing the research, that they discuss uh, the uh, African-Americans involvement during that time in this expedition. Now, again, this was written in uh, August of 1863. Now, this expedition was pretty interesting because one of the key things that they did uh, when they they uh, 
took the expedition, and I have a map to show you. Uh, they took the expedition uh, from Newburn, which was the, which had been taken over by the uh, Union soldiers in 1862. So they had uh, a lot of Africans uh, and that were enslaved tried to make their way behind Union lines on their own, uh, and so with that. Being said, the Africans that made it to the Union line decided it provided them intelligence. Uh, they also had an opportunity to join an outfit called the uh, African Brigade. But first, here's the Union's mission was to destroy the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad and and that way they cut off the food and ammunition supply. And that was in Rocky Mount. They wanted to destroy the cotton mill there. And they also wanted to destroy the ironclad. However, it is my belief that because of the uh, African Brigade, that when they stopped in Greenville, they wanted to release those African soldiers. Uh, uh, well, that were trying to be soldiers. There was 25 of them. Uh, this map shows the route from Newburn to and the route that they took for this expedition. If you'll notice Greenville in the middle, uh, that was the first city that they hit. Afterwards, they went to Tarboro and split up. And on the way back, they were supposed to be following the same route, but they got diverted. And that's what I want to discuss. And with this, I'm, I want to incorporate the research uh, that my people were involved with this uh, rerouting of the uh, expedition. Now, one of the uh, key things that uh, it, I don't know whether Many of you have heard of the Gilmer maps. Uh, uh, the Gilmer maps uh, actually will have the uh, name of the property owners during that time. So a lot of time, if you're looking for um, slaveholders uh, and where they actually resided, the Gilmer maps can help you identify that. And I have another showing. I, I know that I popped something else on the screen, but I have another Gilmer map to show you the detail. Oh, I Shelton, excuse me. Uh -huh. you know, you, if you try just the back button on your computer, it should move your slide back. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> this Gilmer map is kind of an eye map here, but you can see that there are names involved. Okay, and what I tried to do here was take a sample listing of who was in the regiment of uh, my third great grandfather, Thomas Bell, who enlisted in the army, uh, I mean, in the uh, United States Colored Tro Troops in 1863. Uh, they formed Company C, and if you know anything about military history of the Civil War, a lot of these companies were formed around neighborhoods. They were actually recruits from the local area. And a lot of the names that you see here that I provided were part of Company C. As you see the name, some of them may be familiar, may be family names that you're researching. Uh, there's uh, Simon Belcher, uh, Noah Brown. There's my great 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 grandfather, uh, Thomas Bell, Samuel Fleming, Charles Hemby, who's a relative, uh, Benjamin Joyner, uh, we're related to Joyners, uh, Andrew Joyners, Jacob McKay, Joseph Monroe, Thomas Nelson, uh, Noah Taft, Ferdinand Parr, Haywood Tucker, who's a relative, uh, Moses Wiggins, Martin Wilkert, Glaskin Williams, and Hardy Williams. Now I want you to notice the ages. 
If you look at the ages, Thomas Bell was one of the oldest. William Hardy, I know, was a chap. And uh, Thomas Bell was a recruiter based upon his, and he provided other intelligence, but he was a he, mature member of that, um, of his company. The black agenda, there was a separate union agenda, but in reading this, there was also a black agenda. Number one, recruit black soldiers, move families out of the enemy territory and provide military safety and protection to the contrabands. Now, mind you, remember, we had emancipation uh, proclamation that was ratified in January of 1863. And we also talk about Juneteenth, and some people even got the information as late as June. However, here we're talking about people in July fleeing from slavery at, in, in, in the month of July in 1863. So it's very clear that the mandate for emancipation wasn't an immediate release of all uh, African Americans. They actually had to fight in order to. Uh, to end slavery. So with all of this, who was Thomas Bell? Who was Thomas Bell? Um, one of the things that I did, um, Thomas Bell was uh, my third great grandfather. I wanted to show you where he is in line. Uh, I, I put this, uh, he was part of the African I mean, the North Carolina Colored Volunteers, the first North Carolina Colored Volunteers. Now, the North, this was an organization that was formed by African Americans prior to them joining the Union. So they organized themselves and, and as a military, as a militia to protect black families uh, prior to the union inviting them and forming uh, the regiments, the USCT regiments. Um, and the USCT regiment that was formed from this brigade was comprised of the 35th, the North Carolina 35th, the 36th, the 37th, and the 14th heavy artillery. Now, I, I, I took a picture. This is a picture. The reason I had this particular picture, of course, it's not an antiquated picture. This was uh, when I participated in the uh, sesquicentennial Grand Review in Washington, D.C. that was sponsored by the African-American Civil War Museum. And uh, the reason I chose this particular picture is because if you saw in my introduction, I put a military couple. Uh, black women were just as important to this war effort uh, in their capacity. And they formed and organized a colored women union for the support of colored brigade. Now, I come from a military family. My, my father was military. I consider our family a military, my mother military wife. Uh, the spouses are just as important uh, in terms of providing a, a home front uh, and the comfort of the home front while the soldiers risk their lives. And in this case, uh, my great, great, great grandfather risked his life to go, uh, left his home and family to fight for freedom. And that was very admirable of him. But I have to believe also that my great, great, Great grandmother, Henrietta Norris Bell, also participated in her own way. She was a seamstress and she was free. But we'll talk about that as we go on. I have this chart here just to show uh, how I'm related. Uh, if you see the arrow, can you see my arrow? Uh, if you see my arrow, that's my father. Uh, yes, we this can see your arrow. Okay, then his uh, mother, Retha Bell, her father, Willie Bell, 
senior. He was a soldier in the uh, Spanish American War. And uh, well, and so that's a military couple right there. Uh, uh, that's uh, Willie Bell and my great grandmother, who I didn't know and uh, did talk to. She lived to be 92 years old, 90, 91, 91 years old. And uh, yes, we would sit and have conversations and she was very open about uh, history. And that was invaluable because she was the first generation out of slavery, all uh, technically. Uh, and I say that technically because I know that uh, a, a lot of the treatment of the Af Africans, even after uh, legal, uh, after they had been emancipated, was still in some areas, was still bondage. <laughs> Then from there, uh, Willie Bell, uh, my great grandfather, my great grandfather was Jolly Bell. That was the son of Thomas Bell. And there's a story there also, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But where, where you see the arrow here is Thomas Bell, and you will see his wife, Henrietta Narch. Okay. Again, that tape just shows you if you could see it a little bit better. Here's the line that we're talking about, Thomas Bell and Henrietta. Okay, right. no, I thing again. Do you see it? Okay. All right, I thought I heard somebody. Okay, Thomas, this is, I, we do not have a picture of Thomas Bell, but we do have a sketching of Henrietta Norris. This sketching hung in the bedroom of my great grandmother. I never, I will never forget it because as a child, when I first saw it, I thought it was a white woman actually. But in looking at the features closely here, she was always listed as mulatto. And she is listed in the 1850 uh, census along with her mother and sister. And uh, she, she listed in every census except the 1870s. And we'll talk about that because for some reason, uh, I believe because of the movement of what was going on during the Civil War, that they they were displaced for a while. Now, uh, the interesting thing about uh, when I look at Henrietta's um, census is that she lives next door to a white slave owner named Benjamin O. Bell. And so I checked out slave schedule for Benjamin O'Bell to see whether I could get someone around the age group of Thomas Bell. And I couldn't exactly, but the interesting thing is that he, uh, Benjamin O'Bell is located here, his brother is here and his mother is there. And they own uh, a series of, uh, slaves and if you see the column um uh, here that you know there's a column that shows slaves that had deserted and they have two checkpoints here so what does that tell me i checked the ages to see whether they were the age of thomas bell and uh it didn't add up they were teenagers actually uh, that ran away, and they could have very well uh, run away uh, in 1860 uh, to get behind enemy lines. But uh, the slave owner's uh, older brother and mother also had slaves. Now, it's interesting that Henrietta lived next door to him, because, and her sister actually lived next door to the brother. We do know that Henrietta's mother was white, and uh, but she, we can't locate her after 1860. Now, Thomas Bell, uh, according, I know many of you, uh, some of you have probably been to the National Archives. So I, I did, uh, as part of my research, go, I went to the National Archives and I pulled this file. And lo and behold, it provides me some, at least physical uh, information about Thomas Bell. Uh, he's black, complexion, black slash brown, hair black, eyes black. He was five 
five eight, five nine, and one hundred thirty five pounds. His character. Now, one of the things that I wanted to do, you know, very often, what you, when you get this, you you look at history, you look at uh, information, but you want to try to put some meat on the bones of your. Um, ancestor so that you get a good understanding of what kind of person he was. And so in going through the uh, files, I extracted certain information about him. I do know that according to the 1866 cohabitation that they uh, said that they were uh, married in 1849. So he was a loving husband living together for 50 years of marriage. Uh, license and child uh, friend. This was a, a child friend of his. And I, what I did was wrote down some of the quotes and some of the people who said it. Uh, he was a provider and family man, uh, honorable man, a good soldier, very worthy of desired indulgence. And that was according to a furlough a letter from Captain A.C. Rimball took good care of me as his tent mate during the war. Now this was very telling, uh, being that he was older, he probably uh, took care of most of the soldiers, uh, the younger soldiers there, because a lot of these uh, companies and these regiments, they comprise of a younger class uh, and of course, more physically able class. Uh, so it was very unusual to have someone in Thomas Bell's age enrolled at the war, uh, unless he had a significant position or another type of position. I think he, his position was uh, providing intelligence and also keeping up with these recruits. He took good care of me. He's, he was a good neighbor. Uh, Henry Moy, that was from Henry Moy and Arnold Spain. And again, I gleaned this from the affidavit. Henry Moy happened to be a, a great great grandfather of a neighbor that I grew up with as a child, Lawrence Price. That's Lawrence Price, uh, uh, Renato. Uh, that's his grandfather. Uh, his great great grandfather and my great 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 grandfather were neighbors. Uh, he was persistent, as evident, evidence through his nine years of filing pension claims and highly intelligent as evidenced by his response to pension application questions. He also, as a theme, I, he pressed land ownership. And we'll talk about that a little later in something that I found uh, that supports that. Now, Henrietta, his spouse, again, she was in the 1850 census listed by name and along with her sisters. Uh, and she was a free mulatto woman in 1850. She was 17 years old. Uh, her mother, uh, my fourth great grandmother was named Rusha. Uh, we don't know whether that was short for Jerusha, but it's, it's listed as Rusha Norris. And uh, there was an older woman that we assume was my fifth great grandmother, uh, which was Susan Norris. Okay. She had the, her siblings were Martha, Edmund, and Rebecca was not. I, I've updated that. Rebecca was not her sibling. Rebecca was actually the daughter of Martha at three months old. But they were listed as mulatto. Now we have not, and I have not traced who the father was at this point. But it was interesting to. Uh, to go that far back. Now in the 1860 census, which is very interesting, uh, she's, she's listed as a seamstress and she had $50 uh, in assets. Uh, that's worth roughly about $1,000 today. I, I found that very interesting that she had, uh, she because if you go through the census, you don't find many women that have uh, their own assets, personal assets listed. And uh, she was one of them, uh, her and her sister, who was uh, listed below. Uh, again, if you, if you look at this uh, document, you'll see that she was living next door to B.O. Bell. He was single. Uh, 
and he they were around the same age. Uh, she lived. Now here's the lure in the family. The lure in the family is there is a consistent story of someone being raped in our family, and uh, and 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 we don't know whether that was the case because the lure in in, in the family is that some of my um, bell ancestors were very fair skinned and uh, light skinned, I should say, and um, and so as a result, uh, the, some of them uh, could weren't and some of them were so there's a suspicion that perhaps benjamin bell could have been the father of the seven children she has listed next to her because their names their surnames at the time was norris as opposed to bell and her very firstborn was my second great grandfather william jolly bell he's listed there as wj norris we don't know the exact date that he changed his surname to Bell, but he always recognized Thomas Bell as his father. Although possibly uh, Benjamin Bell could have been. I have not done the, uh, I was at, during the time, I, I haven't done any of the, uh, the YDNA on that side. Of course, I, it wouldn't come for me since I come from the maternal side. I would have to find a cousin a male cousin uh, that came from a uh, paternal side to get that verified. But I, to this, since Thomas, uh, since my uh, Jolly Bell recognizes Thomas Bell as his father, I believe that is his father. And I'm honored to have Thomas Bell's blood in my veins. <laughs> Military service. Now, one of the books that if you're interested in this area, uh, and some of you may have already read this book, but The Fire of Freedom, uh, this book is very informative and you could glean a lot of good information from, from that. Uh, because it's important to know that African-Americans planned and planned very well their escape to freedom because that's exactly what it took. It took them, they had to actually fight, spill blood and escape to freedom. Uh, this book tells about Abraham Galloway. And uh, it I was very inspired by this book because these were brave men. They were not from the North coming back to, to the South to fight. They were fighting behind enemy lines and they were also the intelligence that they brought to the Union uh, uh, the whole union effort uh, was phenomenal. Uh, it took them to win uh, the war simply because they knew the terrain. And if anybody knows anything about Eastern North Carolina, uh, the terrain is filled with creeks and swamps and waterways that are very difficult and you have to know what you're doing in order to navigate them successfully. Uh, but Abraham Galloway was part of the same regiment that Thomas Bell was. And I wanted to point that out. Uh, now, military duty. Uh, I believe, uh, based upon my research, that uh, Thomas Bell was definitely a scout. And he went from being a scout and he was involved with the original uh, North Carolina Colored Volunteers. <coughs> Excuse me. He was a boatman. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the things, Bell received, ex he, he received extra bounty for being a boat. His age and experience as a boatman provided invaluable knowledge of the complex waterways of Pitt County and the Tar River region. Uh, the family connections were deep and wide. He probably knew Falkland very well. And since Otter, Otter's Creek passes through the property of the plantation owner named William Norris, where his wife was from. Now, you, it, when I went to the file and pulled this information, and the thing is now, even today, you can get this information on Ancestry.com. They haven't pulled everything. Uh, they don't have a lot of the affidavits, but they have some of the 
uh, listings and cards like this. But if you read it, it said uh, where the arrow is, hold on, where the arrow is said join, uh, he joined the original organization. So he was a part of the first North Carolina colored volunteers. Okay. Now, the theory is that Thomas Bell lived in Belvoir, Falkland area uh, prior to enlisting. He, along with the names of the men who enlisted, were in the company ABC of the 37th Regiment. The surnames correspond to the diverted route taken to escape the rebels. Now, Back to the war, if you remember the chart that I showed you of the route uh, that they took, the reason that they took that route around is that they were collecting a column of their people to be guarded by the Union soldiers as they made their way behind enemy lines. And no one knew uh, as they were coming back down thinking that they were gonna take the same route, the Confederates set up a trap ahead of them. But they said one man from Falkland, <laughs> the most valuable black guy was the man who lived near Falkland, who showed the third New York Calvary the location of their escape route from Dupree's Ford. Indeed, if the Federals had not found that way to get around the seventh Calvary, uh, Confederate Calvary at Otters Creek, uh, uh, then Potter's raid might have ended right there, okay? So uh, I found out that uh, after doing some research that Thomas Bell was the only one from that area in, 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 in the regiment. Uh, and so as a result, uh, I believe he, this was actually talking about him. Now, uh, back to the Gilbert's map. This was where Thomas Bell, as you see the names Bell here and Kenshin Bell, and you see the Otters Creek here. So this uh, was where Thomas Bell resided. And so he was very familiar with that area. Uh, they were trying to come down this road. He had them divert this way. And this was a plan. This was planned not only by him, it was planned probably by the brigade because they wanted to see their uh, pick up people along the way, okay? Uh, now, one of the, this is the actual drawing of the Exodus. Uh, and, you know, this, this is very, um, when I see this picture, I see how long the columns are. Uh, very often we were talking, we talk about how, you know, today, some books that are talking about how uh, the slaves in, it really didn't mind being in that position, so forth and so on. Look at that line. It doesn't look like anyone that wants to be, you know, in the same spot. They, they wanted to be free. And so they found a strategic way to do that. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, some of the numbers uh, say a little bit of the, uh, uh, 600 and all the way up to 1,200. In that, in that mass right there. But only 500 people made it. Some died. Some died along the way in Tarboro. Uh, they, I think they lost around 500 souls in Tarboro. And then 500 were recaptured or killed. There was one story of a brigade, one of the uh, brigade captains tried to protect the back end of that long line and uh, was shot and killed. So, um, you know, this was not an easy seat. This was not a cakewalk. This, I'm very proud that they took agency over their own lives and they took the risk of life or death to get to freedom. Now, since I'm retired, I've been retracing some of the places that Thomas Bell mentioned he was during battle. Uh, one of the things I wanted to show here is that in Plymouth, uh, which was the site of one of the massacres uh, that occurred in the Civil War. His son, Jolly Bell, actually is still in the family. We own uh, uh, 
15, 115 acres in, in Plymouth, North Carolina, which was uh, one of the Confederate strongholds at one point. They do a reenactment there every year. I had a cousin there who still owns the uh, property and uh, he, um, he was a uh, mayor pro temp, but I understand that uh, Plymouth, North Carolina has their very first black mayor in 2019. Now the 37th regiment has a long record. I won't go through each one of them, but he fought in the army of the James under Butler. And so uh, he also uh, witnessed the entry into Richmond and also Bennett's house, the surrender of Johnston, uh, also Fort Fitch, Fishers. And some of these were very important battles. Uh, uh, Thomas Bell was there present. This was on his record. Uh, the Battle of New Market Heights, I visited that. Uh, Post-war, based on the pension records, uh, and he received affidavits from black and white citizens, out-of-state war colleagues, professionals. According to the 1880 census, he lived next door to a former Confederate named Joseph Walsington. I found it very interesting that uh, he worked in a lawyer's office. Uh, he moved back to Falkland. He became a farmer, raised a large family of 23 children. By, he and Henrietta had 23 children. Now I could only account in the census for 18 of them, but she did put in the census record that she that uh, they had 23 children. Uh, one of them, uh, he named two of his kids after Union generals, excuse me. And one was named Ulysses Grant Bell. I've vi uh, visited uh, Ulysses Grant Bell's grave in Miami, Florida, because Ulysses Grant Bell was one of the black incorporators of the city of Miami. So uh, one, that seemed to be a common thing. Uh, he was sued by a wealthy planner, uh, and Henrietta was a witness. Uh, it was Richard E. Reeves, uh, who in 1874, as you know, when Reconstruction was threatened, uh, a lot of the white planters wanted their land back. And uh, apparently Thomas Bell was living on some land that Richard uh, uh, Reeves thought was his. And he wanted to chart, uh, said that Thomas Bell owed him rent and Thomas Bell refused to pay it. Uh, and uh, I read part of the court case, uh, Thomas Bell lost, but he appealed right away. And I don't know, uh, I need to find out how to get the records for this case uh, so I could find the end result. But he did end up owning land, you do know that, uh, because he had tobacco barns on his land and taught the craft of tobacco curry uh, to his uh, children uh, that he had. Uh, Jolly Bell on uh, the land that's currently there that we know in Plymouth uh, has old tobacco barns. Uh, my cousin was not a history buff, so he was talking about getting rid of them. I don't know whether he has, but uh, so with that, I wanted to just show you, this is Ulysses Grant Bell's, uh, uh, his son's uh, tombstone in Miami. And it is listed there that he was one of the incorporators. So. Um, now, Renata told me that I had 10 minutes. Here's, uh, if you ever go to, uh, uh, I think it's Route 33, there's an old uh, doctor's office there. There's where Thomas Bell uh, got his, uh, uh, medical checkups and uh, Dr. Mayo was the name of the doctor. But there's, if you will actually still see this building, there was built in the 1840s. I don't know whether they have torn it down or whether they preserved it at this point. But when I was there, this how it, this was how it looked. And Thomas Bell uh, went there for his, uh, you know, exams to get his pension, and he ultimately received his pension of twelve dollars a month. Okay, he dies, Thomas Bell dies 18, I mean, in 1903, according to the records, he died of a respiratory urinary tract and rheumatism. Uh, Henrietta uh, went, went to, uh, it's interesting, his wife died in 1908, but she went to a publisher in Plymouth, North Carolina to write the government 
on her behalf, and he actually write, writes the government on Henrietta's behalf inquiring about a pension increase. The publisher requested that the government send him the papers and he will fill them out for her. I thought that was a power move by Henrietta because guess what? If you're lying to the editor of the newspaper, then everybody knows that's pretty significant. I, they will probably ignore her being a colored woman, but uh, uh, as it's stated in, in the write-up, but uh, I, I thought she was pretty bold with that. Um, and to wrap it up, uh, we actually uh, went to the Civil uh, African American Civil War Museum and pre presented the Butler Medal to uh, Thomas Bell for fighting in the Army of the James. Uh, that was a, uh, we gave it to him posthumously, of course. And uh, Frank and Harry uh, Jones uh, was there uh, to hear our descendant story. Uh, the picture on the left is me uh, at the 150th sesquicentennial uh, for uh, Grand Review in Washington, D.C that the museum hosted. So, so with that, I'll, I'll wrap it up. I have some other uh, things, but I, I open up. This is just to show that uh, here's another military couple. That's my great grandmother uh, on the right, Amy Bell, uh, Amy uh, Reeves Bell, and my great, great grandfather. I mean, my great grandfather, uh, um, uh, Willie Bell, singer, and and that's my grandmother, uh, Retha Bell, on the right, and uh, Willie Bell Jr. on the left. Okay, and that wraps it up. Any questions? Shelton, thank you so much. That was just a wonderful, wonderful talk, and. Um, before we do questions, we're going to have a few announcements. So take a break, drink some water, you know, okay. run around the block or something. <laughs> Thank you so very much. All um, right. Yeah, I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. Great. Yeah, Shelton, I have to concur. That was a fantastic presentation. You know, you... Well, we'll come back to around with the questions, <laughs> but I have a couple 